a common blood disorder. Uh, actually, I feel <laughs> it is not so common. Uh. Yeah, so many of the conditions that I'm going to touch today is common among the blood disorder, but it's not actually so common among uh, you know, the, the other diseases if you compare to you know, hemorrhoid, you know, lung cancer, you know, breast cancer. You know, so, this, um, um, so, so this topic is actually uh, just to uh, give you some idea, the scope, uh, uh, the landscape of blood disorder as well as um, the, the, the current advancements in the treatment, especially uh, the treatment for leukemia. Right. So, uh, so I would, first I will probably share with you uh, what is the main blood components uh, before we, you know, we, we, we learn about what, what is the blood disorder. So we need to understand what is the blood components and then, uh, then the blood disorder that arises from a different blood component and what are the common signs and symptoms um, and the, briefly the treatment uh, uh, for specific blood disorder. And then we will have time to, for Q&A um, so we, I will try to uh, you know, go through the slide as quickly as possible, but not too heavy as well. So, so blood actually uh, divided into two components. One is a cellular component, meaning uh, which contain all the cells. And the other component is plasma, right? So within plasma, you have protein, water, some of the solutes like uh, iron, nutrients, some waste products. You know, so in, in protein component, you have albumin, you know, some protein factors, as well as hormones. So while in cellular component, you have white cell, red cell, and platelets. So all of this actually play some role in a, in a healthy blood. Yeah. So, so we, this, these are the basically plasma, red cell, white cell, and platelets. So first, we go into the first compartment, plasma. So what is plasma? So it's a non-cellular component. It made out of protein, antibodies, hormones, cytokines. Uh, cytokine is, is actually uh, some kind of the way how the cell to cell communicate. No? Here in modern days, we use cell phone to communicate with each other. So the cell, they don't have cell phones. So they have a way to communicate with each other. That's cytokine. So they release some kind of chemical and the chemical will flow in the blood and go to another part of the organ and then they receive and get activated. So this is how our body communicate with each other. And other common protein in the blood is actually albumin. So what can go wrong? So if something uh, go wrong in platelet and in your plasma, you will have increased clotting problem, clotting risk. And, and then you have, uh, if you, you can also have bleeding problem or if your plasma can become very viscous, you know, um, due to excessive uh, protein, abnormal protein. Yeah? Uh, some of these actually are produced by blood cancer. It can become very viscous and cause bleeding as well as uh, thrombosis. And, um, and then the third one is, the last one is actually the reduction in the normal antibody level. So when you have lack of antibody, you will also lead to problem like uh, recurrent infection. So the, the, one of the commonest blood disorder, I think everybody heard of is DVT, deep vein thrombosis. So these are due to changes in the clotting proteins or due to some blood flow problem. So reduced blood flow. So if you look at this cartoon here, um, so usually DVT happen in the lower, lip, lower limb. Yeah? So the blood clots and then the, the main concern about DVT is the, the, the clots being uh, dislodged and, uh, and flow all the way to the heart and then to the lung, which lead to a condition what we call pulmonary embolism. And pulmonary embolism can, uh, can, can cause sudden death. Yeah? So, so these are the typical pictures of a patient with a DVT. You can see this leg actually a bit swollen compared to the other side. And yeah? these are due to the blockage of the vein causing swelling. So the patient may, may experience pain and swelling um, and this side may feel a bit warmer than the other side. Yeah? So what are the risks? Who can get DVT? So uh, this usually occur in patients undergo some major surgery of the abdomen or some hip surgery. Yeah? Or patient has some underlying clotting, clotting problem and uh, went on this long haul flight. Um, or some patient with stroke, you know, not mobile, lying on the bed most of the time. So this immobility can actually lead to a blood flow problem and eventually clot. Underlying cancer is also one of the major risk factors because uh, cancer cells somehow produce some 
protein that will activate clotting and that will increase the risk of clotting. Especially also cancer patients, they are less mobile, they are sicker, so they will actually have higher risk of DVT. Other, uh, other condition uh, that can lead to um, a clotting problem is antiphospholipid syndrome and some other rare uh, clotting problem as well. So as I mentioned before, the, more, uh, the most dangerous part of our DVT is pulmonary embolism. So the treatment for DVT is actually quite simple. Uh, you need to dissolve the clots. Okay? So there are medicines available like warfarin, heparin, uh, some of the newer agent, which is uh, much better than warfarin, uh, you can, we can use that to dissolve the clot. Most of the patient will need about three months. Some patient will need lifelong. Yeah? Why some patient need lifelong? Because these are usually due to some genetic problem or some of the condition that we cannot solve. So if you dissolve the clot, you stop the anticoagulation, and then the clots will come back. So these are the underlying uh, problem that we uh, cannot solve. Then this patient will need to be on long-term anticoagulation. So flexin is my injection. These are all oral medication. So the other problem that uh, when you have plasma problem is actually increase increase uh, risk of bleeding. So because as I mentioned before, one of the uh, major protein in the uh, in the blood is actually uh, clotting factors. So if you have lack of these clotting factors, you can lead to a clotting problem like having spontaneous bruising, uh, bleeding into the joint, bleeding into the guts like uh, stomach or, or uh, intestine, or worse still, bleeding into the brain and cause sudden death. Uh, so fortunately, all this uh, clotting deficiency or lack of pro uh, clotting proteins is actually quite rare. Yeah? Um, the common one will be those due to uh, chronic liver disease. So because most of these clotting factors actually produced by our liver. But if you have you know, chronic alcoholic uh, liver, then you may have uh, clotting protein uh, deficiency because due to the uh, reduced production. But usually these bleeding are quite mild. Okay, so what are the signs? So easy, very easy, it's just bruising. And uh, usually spontaneous bruising in the non trauma prone area okay so usually as a doctor we look for uh, you know very easily we can knock on something on the trauma prone area like el elbow or the, the outer outer part of our arms so, but if you notice there's a uh, hematoma or bruise over the inner arm or the inner thigh or your abdomen so these are the non trauma prone area that is not so normal yeah. So, so of course you have to watch how if you have, have recovered of this, then you it's better for you to uh, quickly have a blood check. Yeah. So other symptoms would be this PTK. PTK are usually due to low platelet count. So I'm going to touch on low platelet count later on. So it appears like this. Yeah? So the treatment for bleeding disorder uh, usually due to low in clotting factors. So what we do, we just replace them with clotting factors. So we can give blood product like fresh frozen plasma or cryoprecipitate or some other factor concentrate like alphanate, you know, Viriplex, Nova 7. You know? So all this is available uh, depending on what type of clotting factors that you uh, lack of. Yeah? So next part, the second part we're going to talk about is the platelet problem. So, so normal platelet count range between 150 to 450. Okay, so the function of the platelet is to stop bleeding. So, um, so the platelet, so our, our, our blood vessel will have some small little bleeding everywhere in the blood and in the body. So the, the platelet will usually quickly block the, 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 the breakage of the, the blood vessel. And, and that is how the platelet stop the bleeding. If you have no platelet at all, so what happens is that you will develop PTK. You know, the red dots on your skin. Yeah, so, so that can happen. So, so what happens to platelet is that you may have low platelet count due to some, some problem. Like it, uh, this will lead to increase in bleeding, easy bruising, and the patient may have a heavy menstrual flow if you're a woman. Okay? Or some patient can be quite well, no problem, until they go through a big surgery and develop bad bleeding during, during the surgical procedure. So this patient, then they discover that this patient actually had platelet problem. Another extreme will be the high platelet count. So when you have too much platelet, yeah? so too much platelet can also increase the risk of uh, clotting yeah? because 
platelet is actually used for clotting. When you have too much of this, it will clot easily. So, however, if you have extreme uh, thrombocytosis, like more than 1 million, uh, 500, so you will actually bleed. So these are some specific mechanisms that can lead to bleed. I'm not going to uh, explain in detail because it's too advanced for you all to understand. So, um, so this is a picture just to show you. Uh, this The top picture here shows no platelet, very little, maybe just one here you can see. Dot. Here, the bottom picture has a lot of platelet. So what is platelet? You can see the little dots behind the big red cell, right? So these are the uh, platelets. The red cell is actually, the big, bigger one is actually the red cell yeah, that give rise to your hemoglobin. Yeah, so the small little purplish uh, dots are all platelets. So these are the signs and symptoms. Basically, PTK on the skin, these are the common ones, like when you have dengue, right? So you have low in platelet. The platelet can drop all the way down to 1,000, 2,000, and you will develop all this PTK on your, on your hands, feet, and uh, abdomen everywhere. So other than that, they may develop gum bleeding, you know, recurrent nose bleed, uh, prolonged menstrual flow, you know, easy bruising, and PTK. So what are the causes of thrombocytopenia or low platelet? Okay, it could be divided into two categories. First, due to increase in consumption or destruction. Second, due to uh, a production. So, so you have low platelet, it could be due to increase in the use or consumption of the platelet, like infection, if you have bleeding or destruction by antibody. So some conditions produce antibody that actually attack the platelet, their own platelet. This one I'm going to touch on it a little bit later on. Um, second is the reduced production. So there's a bone marrow issue, you know, the bone marrow is not able to produce platelet because platelet comes from the bone marrow. And again, if you lack of certain nutrition like B12 or folate, you may actually have low platelet production. Yeah. So these are the conditions. ITP, immune thrombocytopenic purpura, is a, it's an autoimmune condition that our body you know, becomes very confused, producing antibody, attacking our own platelet. Yeah. You can see here, you know, the, the Y shape is actually the antibody that binds to our platelets here. And then what happened, this uh, platelet that coated with antibody will go through the spleen and the spleen will actually eat up, eat the platelet up. So the platelet will drop. Yeah? So ITP can be uh, divided into two types. One is an acute, another one is chronic. So acute, uh, usually severe, they present with bleeding. Yeah? Like bruising, bleeding, uh, blood in the urine or even GI bleed. So most of these patients present with platelet count of less than 10,000. So our normal platelet count, if you remember, is usually between 150 to 400,000. So this is less than 10,000. It's extremely low. Chronic ITP usually is milder. Most of these patients asymptomatic, meaning without symptoms. Some of these patients discovered incidentally due to health screen, and then after that, uh, hematologist will screen through all the possible uh, tests, and then at the end, will come to the conclusion that this patient has a chronic ITP. Uh, so the, the platelet range between 20 to 100, and most of these are actually quite, quite mild and no symptoms, and we usually leave them alone. We don't give them any treatment. So the treatment of ITP is actually quite straightforward. We just give them steroid in all the acute ITP. Some patients with more severe bleeding, we give them IVIG, a type of immunoglobulin um, that will actually help to increase the platelet very quickly over the next two to three days. So these are more advanced treatments like rituximab and l thrombopack. So one third of the patient in acute ITP will respond and get cured. Another third will actually uh, can be controlled by steroid and they become dependent. So we cannot stop the treatment. The patient had to be on the treatment for a long, long time. And eventually they progress to a chronic ITP. And, and the other third of the patient have no response at all. So these are the uh, uh, problematic patients. However, this, the other one third, uh, now we have a newer therapy is l pack this one, Vivolate, uh, which has actually uh, improved the outcome of this, uh, the third type of ITP. And this is the antibody because we know ITP is due to autoantibody. What happened is that rituximab is the antibody that target the B cell and then get rid of this uh, abnormal B cell. And this abnormal B cell is responsible for the production of abnormal uh, 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 antibody against the platelet. So, so once you get rid of this the original cause, then, um, then the, the ITP can be cured. 
So now it's the other end, high platelet count. So just now we talked about low platelet count, this is high platelet count. So high platelet count could be reactive or it could be due to uncontrolled production, uh, some pathology in the bone marrow produce uh, uh, uncontrolled production of the, of the platelet. So reactive thrombocytosis is actually a normal reaction to uh, an external or internal uh, problem. Say, for example, you have chronic infection or skin problem, and you can actually have high platelet count or chronic inflammation like joint problem. And sometimes you can have a bit of elevated platelet count. And then if you have some bleeding, GI bleed, huh? because the body uses up a lot of platelet, sometimes the platelet and uh, the body will try to produce more platelet to compensate the loss. And sometimes they can a bit overshoot and you have higher platelet count. So the second part is the one that is abnormal which is uncontrolled production because our body usually have some feedback, you know, produce a, the platelet at a, at, a, at, a, at a given level, not too much, not too little. Yeah, so, but then these are usually due to primary bone marrow problem. Okay, and this very often due to some genetic alteration that lead to uh, abnormal cell proliferation, cell divide. Yeah? So um, these are usually what we name as a myeloproliferative neoplasm. In short form, we call MPN. So they have subcategory to polycythemia vera due to high uh, hemoglobin and high platelet as well, essential thrombocytosis and primary myelofibrosis. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to touch on this. This is just a brief introduction that there are some conditions in the bone marrow that can lead to high platelet count. Um, but those are precancerous. They are not exactly a cancer. But some of these patients eventually, many, many years down the road, may actually progress to leukemia. Yeah. So what are the signs and symptoms? In reactive thrombocytosis, usually, usually they are quite asymptomatic, no symptoms. Um, in uh, MPN, thrombocytosis uh, due to MPN, uh, this patient will have symptoms. Okay? They have like pruritus or itchiness everywhere, generalized itchiness, a night sweat um, due to, you know, um, you know some underlying problem, they just sweat until you know the 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 the, the cloth is you know uh, wet and the, the patient need to change um, and fatigue headache uh, sometimes they have big spleen that lead to abdominal fullness and also early satiety and then uh, the most uh, problematic part about this high platelet count is again thrombosis a uh, uh, clot problem clotting problem they can have DVT or even stroke meaning clots in the brain, or heart attack meaning clots in the heart. So, so this patient may die because of this clotting problem. So uh, the treatment is actually, uh, for reactive thrombocytosis, you leave them alone. Usually they have no problem. Most of these patients will settle within you know, a few weeks time. You will back to normal with the platelet count. Only those with MPN require treatment. Yeah? So the aim is actually to lower the platelet count to a normal level, which is 450. Yeah? And this will actually reduce the risk of thrombosis. So these are the options available that we use to uh, lower the platelet count, like hydroxyurea is an oral uh, type oral chemo agent. Interferon is a type of cytokine um, uh, in our body that we can inject to stimulate our immune system to, uh, to correct the underlying abnormality. So it's quite effective interferon. Jakafi is a new agent that will help to uh, uh, block the genetic abnormalities that lead to PV and PMF. Uh, Anagrilla is specifically targeting the platelet, so it will lower the platelets. Aspirin is used to uh, prevent uh, blood clots. Yeah, so, so these are usually used in all patients with a high platelet count. So next, the second, the third part is actually the red cell, hemoglobin. So hemoglobin can be up or low, right? Again, it's the same thing. When you have low hemoglobin, uh, very commonly we call it um, anemia, right? Low in hemoglobin, we call it anemia. High in hemoglobin uh, is the other way, we call it polycythemia, yeah? So anemia could be resulted from reduced production, increased loss due to the bleeding, or increase destruction by something else, something destroying the plate and the red cell. 
Yeah. So reduced production, as you know, all the, the red cell, white cell, and platelet all come from the bone marrow. So it's due to the factory problem. So the bone marrow issue can be due to the primary bone marrow problem, meaning that the bone marrow is diseased and then cannot produce the, the cell at all. Or it was actually due to um, the nutrition problem. So when you do not have the raw material, then you can't produce uh, red cell, white cell, or even platelets. So uh, like when you lack of iron or B12 folate, uh, you will actually have anemia as well. So here, this picture actually show you the normal cell, normal bone marrow, healthy bone marrow is quite pinkish. Uh, the other side is actually aplastic anemia. It's the type of bone marrow failure syndrome. You can see very empty. Yeah? So increased loss are usually due to bleeding from the GI tract, from the gastrointestinal tract or, or menstrual flow in ladies. So you can see here, there are many different reasons for blood loss in the colon. Yeah? The most concerning one is actually the cancer, carcinoma. Yeah? This, this, this bleeding is actually very subtle. Most of the time, patients don't realize it and it's just mixed with your, uh, with your stool. And then until one day, you start to develop symptoms of anemia and then you check uh, very low HB and the iron is also low and eventually doctor will refer you for scope and this is how most patients with colon cancer discover that they actually have colon cancer. Yeah? So destruction is basically due to a mechanism that actually destroys the red cell. Yeah? The red cell has a membrane and get destroyed. Yeah? So uh, thalassemia is one of the inherited disorder who actually have hemolysis, a long-term hemolysis. While uh, another condition, a quiet condition, is an antibody that is targeting our red cell that leads to destruction of our red cell. Almost the same mechanism as um, the ITP, the, the one that is uh, uh, attacking the platelet. So, but this one is attacking our red cell. So, the common disorder is iron deficiency anemia. So, that's why we go a bit more detail on this topic. It's the commonest cause for anemia. Yeah? And as I mentioned before, iron is very essential for the production of red cell and hemoglobin. As you can see from this cartoon, the, the iron actually stays in the center of the heme group and heme group is actually within the hemoglobin. Yeah? So this the whole thing is actually the hemoglobin. And hemoglobin uh, is actually uh, um, come from the red cell. Yeah? If you break the red cell, you will see the hemoglobin. Yeah? So, um, so iron deficiency can be due to blood loss, mostly. Yeah? Either acute bleeding from the peptic ulcer or trauma or chronic bleeding due to heavy menstrual flow or colon cancer, for example. So how do we diagnose? Usually, a patient has some symptoms and then they went for to see a doctor. Doctor will do a blood count and this blood count show that hemoglobin of 5.3 gram which is very low, normal uh, hemoglobin level is at least 12 gram. So this is 5.3 gram. So there are some features in the, this blood uh, uh, report to indicate that this possibly uh, iron and iron deficiency anemia. Like MCV is low, MCH is low, and LDW is high. But because of this, then doctor will suspect that this is iron deficiency anemia. Of course, we have to prove that the patient has lack of iron, right? So this is an iron study that actually show very severe iron deficiency, you know. So, but then we, we will not stop here, no? Not like, oh, we have iron deficiency anemia, we just replace you with oral iron, that's it, full stop. We need to find out why are you losing iron. Most of the time, it's due to the bleeding. So if you're an older group of patients, we will actually do a recommend a scope, you know, upper scope and lower scope to look for uh, any underlying uh, problem, like especially the colon cancer. In the female, young female present with iron deficiency, very often we need to assess their menstrual history. You know, if they have heavy menstrual flow, then we will have to refer the lady to a um, gynecologist. Yeah? So sometimes when you ask, just ask, if you, uh, do you, how's your menstrual flow? Then most of this lady will say, oh, it's quite normal. But then, if you pop a bit deeper, then you realize that their yeah, menstrual flow is not normal because it has been normal to them since young, so they feel normal. So, so, so when you ask them a bit more detail, then we know it is actually not so normal. Yeah. So this is the level. So the treatment of, for, for iron deficiency is quite straightforward. Besides, uh, so usually oral iron replacement you can give, but it has some side effect, like, uh, you know, um, abdominal discomfort, uh, you know, 
um, pain or constipation or this yeah usually patient will complain about oh, I feel very heaty you know taking iron tablets and then your stool will become very dark and sometimes they actually scare the patient off yeah so another way of replacing iron very quickly is by uh, injection so usually we can give this injection monthly until the, the iron is fully replaced so next is actually thalassemia. So I'm going to touch on this because it's quite common in this region, Southeast Asia. So the I think most of you should hear uh, have heard this uh, alpha thalassemia or beta thalassemia. Maybe some of you actually have this condition. Yeah. So these are due to some genetic problem. Yeah? It's inherited from your daddy or mommy. Okay. So, um, so these are due to because we just now you saw this hemoglobin, right? Hemoglobin have different uh, globin chain. Yeah, so you have beta chain and alpha chain, right? So when you have beta gene problem, you produce abnormal beta chain. You know, if you have alpha problem, you produce alpha problem. Yeah. So and then we will categorize uh, thalassemia to different category like minor, uh, intermediate, or major. This depends on the severity of the anemia. Yeah. So in minor thalassemia, minor usually they are asymptomatic. Yeah. Intermediate, they are in between. Uh, major is the one that is the problematic. Usually, patients with thalassemia major, they need transfusion since young, since the age of six months old. And the, the transfusion frequency is like every two to three weeks. And most of these patients will eventually end up with all sorts of problems like iron overload lead, uh, leading to uh, retarded growth, even diabetes, and they have very big spleen. Yeah? Uh, and that actually causes discomfort to the tummy. So how is it inherited? So if you have trait like this one, you have only half the gene, right? That is problematic. You, you're usually quite sick. You, you don't have much symptoms. Uh, so if you have, so your daddy and mommy must carry both gene. Uh, and if they are both of them are trait, you have about 25% chance to become, to get a major, thalassemia major. Uh, if you, uh, also of course, you have 25% to become unaffected. So, so the problem with thalassemia is that if you are female and you know that you have thalassemia trait, then of course, uh, when you're pregnant, you must let your, your, your doctor know, the gynec uh, the obstetrician know, so that they will actually screen your partner as well, so that to make sure that there is no big issue. So if your partner is also normal, is normal, then uh, just you yourself is a uh, trait, then it's fine. You will not get thalassemia major. So, but if your, your, your partner is also a carrier as well as you, your case, so then there may be a chance that your, your baby may uh, have thalassemia major. So, so usually uh, this patient will be counseled by thalassemia um, uh, by hematologists and like us. Yeah. So the diagnosis is quite straightforward. Initially, it was discovered by full blood count and also peripheral blood flow. Uh, so those show some very typical pictures of thalassemia reported by uh, hematologists. Uh, iron panel, so because the pictures looks very alike, very similar to iron deficiency. So we need to differentiate whether this is iron deficiency or not. We have to check the iron panel and this patient will have a normal iron panel. So this one, these two pictures here, just to show you is a uh, thalassemia screen. So doctor may proceed to do thalassemia screen if they suspect you have thalassemia. So the top part here is actually showing a, a beta thalassemia results. And the lower part here, you can see these uh, round little things, with, uh, we call it golf ball appearance. And this is actually indicating alpha thalassemia. Yeah? So in some cases uh, where doctor couldn't actually uh, get any positive result from this, but clinically still very suspicious of thalassemia, we can actually do more detailed testing like genotyping, green genetic analysis to identify whether you actually have thalassemia or not. So the treatment for thalassemia uh, um, is here, it's as follows. So when you're trained minor, you have no treatment. There's no need for you to have any treatment. Most of these patients lead a normal life. Yeah? So the concern is actually their offspring, their baby. So make sure they, they marry uh, a non-thalassemia partner. Yeah. <laughs> so you cannot choose, right? Uh, so thalassemia intermediate um, is, um, is, is actually uh, uh, in between. Uh, some of these patients are quite well, but they have much, much lower hemoglobin. The hemoglobin can be uh, ranging between 7 gram to 9 gram, yeah? uh, compared to a normal level of 13 gram. Yeah? In thalassemia minor, the, the hemoglobin level is between 10 gram to about 
11 gram. So they are not so low. While thalassemia major, the hemoglobin can be as low as 4 gram, 5 gram. So, so this patient would require a transfusion, as I mentioned before. And because of the regular transfusion, uh, patient develop iron uh, overload because every bag of blood contains a lot, a lot of iron. So, and if you keep transfusing iron into your body and the body has no way to get rid of the iron, then you will develop iron overload. Too much iron in the body can actually lead to heart failure yeah? and also liver failure and all kinds of endocrine problems like diabetes, hypothyroidism, growth retardation, you know, hypogonadism, like lack of uh, you know, sex hormone. Yeah? So a lot of problems can happen. So in a very, very selected patient, we can actually offer them a bone marrow transplant in a thalassemia major or only in the thalassemia major. And this has to be done quite early in, 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 the, in, the, in the patient's life, like usually in the age of uh, 13 or 14 years old. Anybody go above that, most of the time, it's quite difficult to treat. So the two other pictures here is to show you the iron chelation therapy. So this patient received a lot, a lot of iron, a lot of blood, so they need some kind of medicine to get rid of the iron. So this is an iron chelator. So when you take this, it will get rid in the guts or get uh, you will uh, or maybe you will actually you uh, pee up the, the iron. So the urine may appear uh, reddish yeah, because of the iron. So the next part of the uh, uh, hemoglobin problem is too much hemoglobin. Yeah. So again, you have primary and secondary. So secondary means it's a body reaction to a second secondary to something. Yeah, so like in uh, secondary polycythemia is usually referring to a normal compensatory mechanism by our body due to lack of oxygen. So if like those people who live in Himalaya or Nepal, so if you check their hemoglobin level, their hemoglobin level is high, maybe in a region of 16 gram to 17 gram. So it's very high. And then, or some patient with this sleep problem like obstructive if sleep apnea, you know, always get obstruction during the sleep uh, and because the tongue falls back. Yeah? So this patient have lack of oxygen, especially at night. And then they will eventually, over months to years, they develop high hemoglobin. It's a body compensatory mechanism trying to get more oxygen into our body by increasing the hemoglobin level. Some patients with lung problem will also have the same problem, like asthma or chronic smoker have some chronic lung disease. Um, so they will have this problem as well, increased hemoglobin level. So the problematic one is actually the primary polycythemia, uh, meaning uh, it is due to uncontrolled pro production again by our bone marrow. So, so these are you know, the condition that can lead to that polycythemia vera. These are usually due to genetic mutation, JAK2. So this picture is to show you the red cell appearance. And if you have polycythemia, you have you know, more red, and you appear more red, more uh, you know, plethoric compared to a, a no polycythemia patient. Yeah. So what are the symptoms of polycythemia? Of course, you will appear very, very red on your face. Um, sometimes people may think, oh, you have hypertension, you know, too, too, too red. Um, and um, fatigue, you know, very surprisingly, you have too much hemoglobin, you actually feel more tired because the blood cannot flow very well. Yeah? And most of these patients will have headache as well. So I have patients presented with chronic headache to GP, eventually have some health screen done and found to have hemoglobin of 20 gram. It's a young lady somewhere. Yeah? So these are very clear kind of polycythemia vera because further evaluation found that she actually had jet to mutation. So some patients also would have some blurring of vision because the blood flow in the blood in the eye actually got obstructed and causing blurring of vision. And many of these patients will also have itchy skin. Yeah? And they can have blood clots as well in the in the vein and stroke you know, due to blood clots or heart attack. So the treatment uh, for secondary polycythemia, we have to treat the underlying cause. If you have obstruction due to the sleep apnea, you have to do some uh, weight reduction programs, sleep position, some ventilation, assisted ventilation during sleeping time. So, or, or that if you have lung problem due to uh, uh, the polycythemia due to the lung uh, issue, then you have to treat the underlying lung problem or give them oxygen supplements so that the, uh, the hemoglobin will not continue to rise to a dangerous level. So, uh, so the, the concern here is, again, is the primary polycythemia, that the body has uncontrolled production of red cell. 
So what do we do? Just get rid of the red cell. Yeah, you just do something like blood donation. Of course, this blood we don't donate to people because these are considered abnormal blood. So we usually we just discard the blood. Another way is that we take oral medicine, trying to reduce the production of the red cell or injection interferon. No, interferon come out again. So MPN is actually interferon is actually very effective for MPN, like high white cell count, high uh, platelet count due to MPN. JAK2 inhibitor is a new drug that actually block the JAK2 gene because polycythemia vera actually have JAK2 mutation. Uh, and because of that mutation, this gene become overactive. And this JAK2 inhibitor actually, uh, you know, try to control the function of the JAK2 so, so that it is not overreactive. So we go to the last part, which is the white cell. Yeah, so too high, too low. Um, at normal function, so these are the problems that may arise. Uh, so we have you no know, white cell at normal range between four to ten thousand. Okay, so within the white cell itself, we have different population of white cell. So you have neutrophil, monocyte. You know, neutrophil is here, monocyte is here, and then lymphocyte, eosinophil, and basophil. All of this cell actually has their own function. Okay, neutrophil help fighting the bacteria. Lymphocyte will help fighting the bacteria and, the limb, uh, and, the, and, and also the viral. Monocyte will also help eat up all the abnormal uh, the, the bacteria. Yosinophil uh, work in an allergic reaction and basophil as well. So it has its own uh, function and usually this different subtype of white cell that exists in the, in the appropriate proportion. So you cannot have, say, this yosinophil are usually up to 5%. If you suddenly have 50% of the white cell is actually eosinophil, then this is not normal as well. Yeah, so it has an appropriate uh, 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 proportion. Yeah? So when you have low uh, white cell, you can also, uh, it, was, it, it is usually due to bone marrow failure problem, like bone marrow failure to produce cell, like red cell, white cell, or platelet, or aplastic anemia. Yeah? So if you have too much high white cell, this is the major concern, right? So it can be reactive, meaning your body reacting to some kind of infection, producing more white cell to fight the infection, or, or could be due to bleeding. Sometimes when you bleed, your, your body lose blood and lose a lot, use a lot of platelet. Your, the body try to produce more red cell and platelet. At the same time, they also increase the production of white cell. So this can happen. Then the concern, the, the, the worrying part is actually the, the leukemia. So when you have high white cell count, you worry about leukemia. Uh, other condition that's non-leukemia one is actually the NPN. You know, NPN is the bone marrow overreactive. You know, it's just keep on producing cells. So NPN is something like a pre-leukemic phase. Yeah? So when we see a high white cell count, the first thing we usually do is to uh, actually do a blood firm. Uh, meaning we actually uh, make a slide and look under the microscope to see whether this white cell, is it a normal white cell or just abnormal like leukemia cell. Yeah? If it is a leukemia cell, we have to investigate urgently. You know, usually you need a bone marrow aspiration like this picture show. And it's a needle. It's quite a simple procedure. Usually we can do it in the clinics, like in 10 minutes procedure. You put a needle in, aspirate the bone marrow cell out. And then we run through some very sophisticated tests like flow cytometry to identify the subtype of cell, the subtype of leukemia. Or we can run through some genetic testing uh, uh, to see what are the genetic abnormalities so that we can actually choose uh, an appropriate treatment for the sub different subtype of leukemia. So these are the overview of a leukemia. Yeah? So leukemia can be divided to acute leukemia or chronic leukemia. Within this acute and chronic leukemia, you can subdivide them to uh, myeloid or lymphoid, and eventually you will come to these four common, four common leukemias, AML, ALL, and CML and CLL. Yeah? So these are the pictures under the microscope that will help us uh, differentiate between different uh, leukemia. Of course, this will be applicable to hematologist's eye. So these are the signs and symptoms can, can be quite horrible looking uh, of leukemia. So when you have leukemia, you have overproduction of white cell, and then your bone marrow function become compromised. So your red cell production and also your platelet production become impaired. So when you have red cell production reduced, you have anemia, very pale, and you look very pale. And then if you have low in platelet count because of the overproduction, overcrowding of the white cell, 
Suddenly you have bruising. Usually these are spontaneous. Some patients may have this limb node swelling over the neck or axilla or in the armpit or in the groin region. So if you see abnormal swelling, especially non-tender, non-painful one, is the one that is dangerous. If you have a swelling and it's painful, then these are usually due to infection. So I'm not that worried. This part, this gum swelling is due to a very subtype of leukemia, uh, AML. Uh, so it can actually produce, uh, this is quite an extreme case uh, just to show you. And some leukemia can infiltrate the skin causing this kind of nodule. And some leukemia can lead to large spleen as well, causing a uh, fullness of the abdomen. And many of these patients with leukemia actually have recurrent fever. So the, many of these actually have initial presentation to GP. You no, know? I fever, go to GP, give antibiotics, treat, fever never subside, go to another GP, do again. So eventually one of the GP will do an FBC, maybe they think it is a dengue, and then they find the white cell is very high. So that's how they, the patient eventually ends up in the in, in, in hematology clinics uh, or the hospital. Yeah, some they can have a thick and night sweat as well. So the treatment of leukemia, um, I think most of you know chemotherapy, you no know, cancer. These are the conventional way of treating leukemia. Giving chemo, some of these patients may need bone marrow transplant, okay, or stem cell transplant, the newer term. So, um, so it depends on the subtype of leukemia, whether you're AML, ALL, CML, or CLL. Yeah? So the modern way of treating leukemia is more targeted with targeted therapy, immunotherapy, and cellular therapy. Yeah? So this picture, just to give you an example of the immunotherapy, is a genetically engineered uh, antibody which has two heads. One head will attach to the abnormal leukemia cell, the other head will attach to a normal T cell, which is the, our white cell, the healthy one. And this T cell will attack the, the leukemia cell and kill the leukemia cell. Another way is that we design an antibody that tag the antibody with this very powerful uh, chemotherapy. And this antibody is actually very specific to leukemia cell and it would attach to the leukemia cell and then somehow the leukemia cell will swallow this antibody and kill themselves. So, uh, so this is the, the immunotherapy part. Cellular therapy is this picture. This is CAR T. I guess some of you may have heard CAR T therapy. Is, this is the most advanced therapy that you can offer to leukemia patient. It's not widely available and, uh, and, 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 and only certain uh, big center will have that. And what happened is that we, we take out patient white cell the normal T cell, and then we do some genetic engineer to it, and then we we actually alter the white cell. Um, uh, we educate the white cell to become leukemia specific. So they have some kind of weapon on on the surface of the white cell. So and then after that, we actually expand the white cell to millions of it. We can actually do it in outside the body, and then reinfuse back to the patient. And this uh, CAR T will actually go and attack all the leukemia cells specifically and, and it's very very effective uh, so 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 i think this is going to come in the very near future probably in five to ten years time now it's still not widely available uh, nuh national university hospital has it um, so this is the only place that you can have it um, um, in singapore so other are targeted therapy like vinitoclax uh, this is a conductive, it's also a targeted therapy. So basically, nowadays the scientists would have actually discovered a uh, different cancer due to some genetic alteration, lead to some overactivity of certain enzyme or certain pathway. So they design a drug to actually target that specific the, the specific pathway, which is also the weakness of the, the cancer cell. And, and hence it should, it's only targeting the cancer cell, minimizing other uh, side effect like from those from the chemotherapy. So these are called targeted therapy. So this, this newer treatment has uh, improved the, 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 the survival of many different types of leukemia. Take for example, in CML, chronic myeloid leukemia. In old days, you can only save about 8% of the patient or maybe lower. Yeah? So over the years, now we can actually cure up to 92% of the patient. This is CLL in another chronic leukemia. And with the newer treatment, you know, and it's actually the oral treatment, you know, can actually bring the survival more than double up. Yeah? 
And this one in a, an AML, which is very aggressive leukemia in elderly, especially in elderly, you can't give them chemotherapy because they're too weak to receive that. And this new treatment is actually a com oral treatment combined with some uh, injection on the skin, like something like a diabetes medicine. You inject and then you can actually improve the survival uh, compared to those just receiving injection. So leukemia currently, you know, is curable. Now, most of the patient can be cured. Yeah. So it is not something deadly anymore. Yeah. So, um, so we, if you go to the appropriate doctor, they will offer you the, the, the correct treatment. So these are the, uh, our center. Okay. So the, we treat uh, all kinds of blood disorder, like um, leukemia, especially and I specialize in leukemia. And then we have myeloma treatment, or we have targeted therapy, immunotherapy as well, lymphoma, and then MPN. I'm also specialized in MPN. So we do have chemotherapy, targeted therapy, uh, stem cell therapy, immunotherapy. Yeah? Cellular therapy is coming. Now I work very closely with NUH. So when I see patients that are suitable for cellular therapy, uh, like CAR-T, I may refer them to um, NUH for further treatment.